Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 120. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast. You are joined by the one and only Dr. Jonathan Light, as Dr. Michael Bug is on short-term parental duty that has kept him away today. He is looking after his young family, which he is needed to do. And so I am running show today. You are in for a great episode with Andrew Rotz. And before we get into that episode, uh, I hope all of you are doing well. As you'll likely seen online through our reels, our social media, we have brought on a new social media company and they are doing great for um, reinvigorating our brand behind the scenes and working on us for oppor future opportunities that we have with the veterinary project and the community as well as the podcast. Um, so I want to give you the heads up just in case you're online and going, what the heck is Dr. Jonathan and Dr. Bug doing? Hey, we've been at this for just under two years now, and it has been a great run, but like anything, you need to refresh after a while. So continue to see some of those changes in the coming weeks. As we get into our podcast today, as I mentioned, Andrew Rotz, Rotz is joining us. Uh, Andrew is a CFP practitioner, which is Certified College Financial Consultant, an NAPFA member with a lifelong mission to serve his community. In his role as the Director of Personal Finance and Financial Literacy at NCSU's CBM in Raleigh, North Carolina, Andrew teaches students to plan around many factors, including interests, abilities, values, personal personalities, background, market conditions, and circumstances. In his work with Tide and Tenpist Financial Planning, Andrew helps currents and their, uh, he helps clients and their families know and understand their needs, wishes, wants, and the world that influences them to make intentional financial and life decisions. His mission is to enrich, educate, and engage the veterinary community to achieve better financial wellness and peace of mind. Andrew is the co-host of Podcast, Navigating the Veterinary Profession, a podcast offering advice to the veterinary profession on career development, personal finance, and the business of veterinary medicine. Andrew also serves his country as a U.S. Navy Reserve Officer and recently returned from a deployment to the Middle East. He's married with his two sons and lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. Andrew and I first met uh, on a mutual panel within the Veterinary Financial Summit in October, and I was very impressed by his approach, his knowledge, and his dire desire to educate the veterinary community, whether you are a student currently in college, dealing with debt and uh, trying to understand your first contracts and or you're already out in the vet space looking to transition into ownership, you are going to enjoy this conversation. So taking that further and getting into it, please join me and enjoy my conversation with Andrew Rocks. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. It is a pleasure to get you on. We were, I would say, uh, the last month, month and a half getting scheduling around and it is, like I said, a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for the invite. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to a really good conversation. And vice versa. We are missing uh, my wingman, my partner in crime, Dr. Bug, uh, with some parental duties. So you're going to just have myself on today. And for a little bit of background information for our listeners, it is Andrew and I met as a uh, uh, panel members with the recent Veterinary Financial Summit back in October, uh, speaking on financial investment. And the group was a panel of four or five individuals and just really enjoyed some of the conversation and uh, sharing that was happening on that panel and immediately reached out after you and said, 
Andrew, need to get you on the podcast. There's a lot there to be shared with our listeners. So um, really appreciate you making it happen. A place where I thought we could start is a little bit of background in terms of you're not a veterinarian, but you deal almost exclusively with veterinarians, I believe, and you could correct me if that's wrong. Um, but where did you get started in both your financial world and now specifically working with veterinarians and veterinary professionals? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's it's been a long and winding journey. I have had a, a very atypical career in, in pretty much any way you look at it. Um, you know, I got off active duty in the Navy and, and, and started working in the financial services industry with Fidelity Investments for a handful of years, five or six years, decided I had had enough of that and um, was interested in exploring opportunities, working with smaller businesses, smaller smaller shops, one or two or three advisor shops. Um, realized that that's not where my passion was and found literally the perfect setup they were looking for a certified financial planner um, to come in and build a financial wellness program from scratch at uh, North Carolina State University's College of Vet Med. Um, and so, you know, it, and it was right here in North Carolina, which is where I'm located. And it just kind of the stars all aligned and it worked out. So I kind of dove in head first, trying to understand the, um, you know, uh, unique aspects of the vet med world. Um, both from a like a career standpoint, the various sectors and industries you can go into, various career fields you can you can go into in vet med, and then also right what what some of the unique challenges from a financial planning financial wellness standpoint were, um, and from there you know it's it's all about building your network and talking to people and getting different perspectives and and tossing around different ideas and so it's just kind of organically grown from that. Um, to the point where, you know, multiple universities I've worked with, um, multiple veterinary employers I've worked with, um, all with the initiative, all with the idea of, of just promoting financial wellness, promoting this idea that you can take control of your financial future and your financial now. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, promoting healthy habits that also trickle into mental health, um, you know, mental health awareness and improving those aspects of things um, and just trying to help people understand that all of these aspects of wellness are, are so interconnected. Financial wellness, physical wellness, emotional wellness, relationship wellness, yeah. um, they all play a part in, in the role of the others. So it's, that's kind of what I've found is my passion and I just kind of stumbled into it um, just due to you know, I had the right credentials and the right experience that NC State was looking for. And, and um, you know, it's been a great fit. So it sounds like passion meets opportunity meets qualifications. And uh, you've, you've got to this place now. Now, going backwards a little bit in terms of a couple of comments that you made there in that summary, thank you for sharing, is NC State had a director of personal finance and financial services, if I'm reading correctly. Is that your, your role while you were at NC State? Yes, absolutely. Yep. So they were they were creating the role based on what they'd seen at another university. Um, and, uh, you know, they didn't, I don't think really knew what they wanted. They just know they, they wanted this type of functionality. Um, and they have done a, an exceptional job of building a wellness capability at NC State's CVM. Uh, we have a counselor, actually, we have two counselors on staff. We have a career services director. We have personal finance, um, in addition to your typical student services stuff, like admissions and registration and stuff like that. That's unbelievable. How many students at NC State now? Uh, we have, uh, I think we're we're at 100, 100 per class, and we're increasing, I think, slowly over the next couple of years. So, okay. you know, roughly 400 DVMs, and then maybe 100 house officers. Okay. And from that standpoint, if somebody wants to come spend time with you, just because in Canada, this that role does not exist in any of the universities that I've spoken with in, in Canadian la university landscape around veterinary medicine, um, individuals book appointments and have to pay to be able to come see you, or is that directed through the university, mm -hmm. just in terms of understanding what that role looks like? Yeah, it's a great question, because um, it can be really <laughs> confusing. Um, so I am I'm open... As as the director of personal finance and financial literacy, I am I'm open to working with NC State um, DVMs and house officers. 
um, okay. up to a year after they leave NC State. Um, outside of that, so so here's where kind of the one of the other hats that I've been wearing um, comes into play. I basically started my own LLC to yes. do some consulting for folks who got outside of that one year window um, and still wanted to to work with somebody that they trusted and respected and understood, you know, the ins and outs of of their community. So I built Tide and Tempest Financial Planning um, to facilitate those kinds of conversations. So, so that's an easy, you know, just, just Google that bad boy. It'll take you to my website and we can communicate in that way. Um, yeah. And, and I, you know, I use that LLC to work with, with um, companies that are interested in bringing me in for consultations um, as well as other universities I've, I've done speaking engagements at, et cetera. So interesting. Talk about putting yourself in the right spot. You have a funnel of students that need to know and understand more about their financial literacy and, and education. Yep. And then post-graduation, build value, build trust, build relationship, and it continues. Nice moves. Exactly. exactly. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to empower them with, with the tools and knowledge to, to make good decisions for themselves. Um, one of the other pieces I teach them while they're at NC State is how to go find a planner to build a relationship with, even if it's not me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to, to point to them to someone else, especially if they want someone that's local to them, wherever they're going to be around the country. That's really important to a lot of people too. And um, so it's really, again, just about giving them those tools in their toolbox to, to make the right decisions, ask the right questions, um, and advocate for themselves. Nice. So if we look at the latter half of 2022, which we are in right now, Andrew, where do you see the, let's start with the struggles. Where do you see the largest struggles for whether it's veterinary students or those younger veterinarians fresh into practice in the current economic conditions, which are <laughs> high debt loads, lots of opportunity for practice, but you need to get there first and then understand how to deal with that money coming in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the biggest, I would say the, the biggest challenge kind of across the board is inflation um, and the impact that it has on everything from, uh, I don't know how much house I can afford. I don't know what my rent should be. I don't, you know, I'm moving to a new area and I'm not aware of the cost of living there um, to, I don't know how much of a salary to negotiate. Um, all of those things are impacted by inflation. And so it's a big question mark. For me, I should say, that's probably my biggest challenge is, is approaching all of those conversations through the lens of, I don't quite know how inflation is going to impact the normal, like the normal conversation, right? Yep. Um, and so that's, that's a big challenge for me to not only communicate that, but then to also build some sort of a, a planning conversation around um, for the students, uh, I mean, salaries are great. They're rising even in the lower paying aspects of the industry. Um, benefits are getting there. You know, I think employers, small businesses are finally hearing that, you know, hearing the message that we've been communicating about, you know, it's easy to start a simple IRA and give them a retirement benefit, you know, life and health and disability insurance and license defense and, and all of those types of insurances are super valuable. And, most of this stuff is tax deductible for the business. So fortunately, I, I feel like employers are hearing that. Plus, there's a lot of competition from, from corporate vet med um, to make your packages competitive. Um, so I'd say the biggest challenge with students themselves is probably instilling them with the confidence mm. to know that they have leverage in the conversation with with potential employers you have leverage there are so few dvms looking for jobs graduating with dvms um, and there's a ton of job opportunities out there and it's really important to leverage leverage that because uh, it doesn't just impact you it impacts your peers it impacts the the years that are coming behind you in terms of making the community better and 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 more resilient for for future for future years, future generations, even. Given this has been going on for a couple of years in terms of the professional shortage, and a couple of years being you know five six plus years now, where we've started to see that the the uh, the ads and the needs for veterinarians has gone up. Uh, do you still run into veterinarians or veterinary students that um, 
aren't aware of the current market conditions? Is this still an education when you describe the confidence needed? Because leverage goes both ways. Yes, leveraging the conversation, but also being educated in the way to approach an employer is important. And I can speak on that on the employer front. Um, but is, is that what you're seeing or, or you know, do people know where they stand now? <clears throat> yeah. yeah um, so I'll just highlight that, you know, I'm a full-time employee at, at NC State um, and there are still DVM students that I do not see before they graduate. I don't know if it's head in the sand. I don't know if it's ignorance. I don't, you know, I don't know what the reason for it is. Um, I, I am in the curriculum and, in, and by that, I mean, like I teach classes that they're required to take, but they're not required to come visit me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it is absolutely what I encourage all of them to do. Um, because that is where the biggest value that they can get out of me is, is going to happen. One-on-one -on -one situations, bringing spouses or planning partners or parents, if parents are, are part of the planning conversation. Um, and, and yeah, there's still every graduating class I've been, this is, this will be my fifth year. Um, and every graduating class, there's still a portion. I look up on the wall of portraits and like, never saw that person, never saw that person, never saw. So there's absolutely um, that aspect of like, are they doing everything that they can to prepare themselves for the workforce? Um, yeah, because there's and, only and, two. And, there's only two ways. They they already have their own financial planner and they're set going forward. Or two, like you said, either heads in the sand, ignorant, or not educated to the opportunities yep. of learning. Yep. <clears throat> absolutely. And like I said, I mean, I'm 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 plugged into their into their curriculum. They know I exist. Um, so yeah. you know. That, that's beside the fact. Now, um, there's absolutely plenty of faculty that are mentors to these folks who plenty of them are very proactive and like, yes, you need to go see Andrew. Yes, you need to get this question addressed, yada, yada, yada. But there's plenty of faculty that are also um, oblivious to the progress that the community has made uh, in terms of financial wellness and, and the numbers of, of the industry. Um, so that's something that we also have to combat. Um, and we're doing so proactively and they've been very receptive to us coming in and giving talks to, you know, the faculty from this, this sector of the industry, the faculty that focus on this sector, right? We'll, we'll go in and have conversations with them and we'll share with them the numbers that we have. Um, and am I happy to draw conclusions for them as to why A plus B equals C? Sure. Um, but I'm also equally happily happy to let them do that mental math themselves and figure out okay, so if, if our students negotiate, 65% of them actually get what they ask for. Hmm. So I should be encouraging my students to negotiate and, and apply for multiple offers, right? Makes sense. 35% um, yep. of our class doesn't negotiate, therefore they don't get anything higher than what is offered. It's like, well, that's a no-brainer, folks. So let's let's take a slightly more business-savvy approach to, to those conversations. Excellent. Uh, in that realm, then, negotiation can be uh, overwhelming. It can feel scary. It can be a deterrent to people even wanting to start the conversation, depending on personality style, psychology of money, where they've come from, all of those. Do you find yourself working on the psychology of negotiation and or do you refrain and go strictly into here's the financial position, here's where you could be opportunity? Yeah, a little bit of both. Absolutely. Um, I tend to start with, and, and again, we, we also have um, uh, faculty, a faculty member who, who is knee deep in, um, the, in this world as well. So it's not just me, fortunately. Again, it's just another member of our team who um, teaches uh, practice finance. Um, and so she's knee deep in this research as well, um, the AVMA economic data, all that stuff. And so we collectively approach every job um, offer that we see with, okay, you know, here's here's what you're being offered. Here is what the um, averages for for based on the the, mo the latest AVMA economic data, which is admittedly about a year and a half delayed. Yep. Um, you know, let's say graduating class of 2021, their data was just released this October. Um, so it is, there's a slight delay. Again, that's part of the whole inflation conversation that I mentioned earlier. But um, so we approach it in that way first, right? Here's what you were offered. Here is 
based on the latest data, here's the averages. How do you feel? Um, you know, this one's a little bit higher. This one's a little bit lower. What's most important to you? Um, maybe it's a, it's a slightly lower salary, but you get three or four more days of PTO. Maybe you get 10 weeks of paid maternity leave, right? Like whatever benefit it, it might be that might be more important to you than the salary. We just want to make sure that we're kind of recognizing some of those priorities um, and that we are putting the emphasis in the negotiation strategy on what is most important to you. Excellent. Are you going to get A plus across the board in every single category that you might want? Maybe, but likely not. Um, so that's where it really comes down to the psychology, to your point of, of identifying what's most important to you and then fighting for it and advocating for yourself, um, not just because, but then also cr like crafting the arguments for, okay, well, why do you deserve those things? Um, let's talk about what values you bring, what unique experiences have you had during selectives or um, externships or, or what have you, what have you what do you bring to the table that sets you apart from other candidates? Excellent. Um, do you, um, on that note, as an employer ask question then, do you go into the, the expectation from an employer standpoint, if upon asking for a higher salary or base wage, if we're talking pro sal, et cetera, what the expectation differences are going to be for the employer, given that, hey, if salaries are going up on average 20%, guess what? Somebody's got to pay for that. And it is the employer and or it's the client. It is at the end of the day going to be the client. And I was speaking with another employer about this yesterday is, is there, is there knowledge by the new students and by recent grads as to the added stress that is out there with inflation, with the bills rising and that communication and that proactive communication that needs to be had there because we're all feeling it. Is that discussed yeah. at all? Um, I, I can't say that it's across the board 100% discussed, but absolutely it does come up. Um, and, and the perspectives that I try to share are, again, when it comes to what other values can you add besides your veterinary medical expertise, right? Yeah. Um, what is your business savvy? Do you understand cash flow? Do you understand inventory costs? Do you understand the other aspects of the business of running the practice? And how can you add value there? Are you encouraging your clients to take out pet insurance on their pets so that the financial implications of treating them appropriately aren't such a burden for the owners? And that way, again, when it comes back, back to like the, the fatigue that veterinarians feel about, you know, I, I couldn't do everything in my power because the client couldn't afford it, right? Like, well, okay, so have that conversation about getting the pet insurance and then they can afford more of the procedures, which helps fulfill you because you can practice more of the medicine that you want to to save animals, Definitely. right? It's like this self-fulfilling prophecy of like, you have to give them the tools so that they can allow you to take better care of their pets. Um, so yeah, so so those conversations are absolutely happening. Good. Um, I, I think... I've struggled being in, in the veterinary med medical world uh, in the academic setting because to me, I feel like a certain standard should be accomplished by the time that they're a DVM and they should be able to do things competently. When a lot of the DVMs that are graduating don't feel confident being able to do those things. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily recommending a complete curricular overhaul by the AAVMC, right? But like, it's one of those things where if, if what we're producing for a very high price tag, but mind you, yes. is not what the industry needs, why aren't we reevaluating things to approach it a little bit differently? Huh. So that our, our DVMs are more or better equipped. The businesses and the practices that are out there, um, you know, have, have refined and revised expectations for what they're getting. Um, and the community itself thrives as a result. It's a great topic of conversation, which throws people a little bit off sometimes. We chatted about this at the Veterinary Innovation Summit as well, too, in Portland this year, is, is what we are producing needed in the industry. And as an employer, ooh, there's, there's lots of pros and cons to what you just described. And there's a lot of people that balk at having that conversation because heaven forbid you make change. Yeah, absolutely. The, the most dangerous six words in the English language. It's always been done this way. 
and you can't you can't use that mindset you have to approach problem sets with with an innovative mindset how how can we disrupt this and and yeah maybe you might fail maybe it might not succeed at first but you're probably going to get some good nuggets of, of lessons learned that you can then apply and improve things going forward right and it's iterative it has to be iterative um and and i don't see anybody really doing that hmm <laughs> so if you had a magic globe and you looked out one year, two years, three years from now, what are the places where you get excited when it relates to financial planning, financial success for your clients? And what are the places you're most scared of? Um, I, I am very excited about the proliferation of fringe benefits um, in the industry. It's, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's been too long since you know for it to not have happened um but we're getting there a fringe, what do you consider a fringe benefit sorry to jump yeah. in um so so pretty much anything outside anything that you would get from an employer outside of salary and bonus um okay. so that's health insurance dental insurance vision um continuing education credit and time off or i should say money and time off um you know parental paid parental leave outside of, of family medical leave um, FMLA in the US um, you know student loan repayment stipends all that kind of stuff um, when I first got into the industry and started getting my hands dirty it was the the norm was you know you get your base salary you might get a bonus it might be production based it might just be you know general performance based um, and you'll probably get a couple hundred bucks that you can throw towards health insurance. Yep. Right. And that was kind of like the norm. And then if they had a retirement account available, like that was, that was not unheard of, but like that was a big time plus. Agreed. Um, and so now for, with the, and again, I, I hate to say it, but I think corporate medicine has, has put the pressure on individually owned or just small practices or, or small conglomerates to up their game. And the good thing is, those capabilities exist and they're affordable um, for the practice to to implement. And oh, by the way, most of them are tax deductible too. So it's like, it's a no brainer, right? You both benefit from this thing. Um, and we know that fringe benefits improve uh, employee retention um, because employees are happier, they're healthier, they're less stressed. Um, you know, so you're getting a better doctor for longer. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, so that's what I'm really excited about. It's kind of the proliferation of that, even amongst smaller, smaller practices. Um, I think the other aspect of the question was, what am I most nervous most about? In the nervous industry? or scared about That's correct. Yep. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so kind of twofold, and I kind of alluded to one already, which is, um, I am honestly very nervous that because of the innovation we're seeing on the employer side academic institutions are going to get left in the dust um they are not going to be able to uh, appropriately prepare dvms for the workforce because it's going to be a completely different workforce than it was even 10 years ago um and and that's a good thing right like the the industry is progressing um, and I don't see academia progressing. I see them in doing the exact opposite. I see them digging their heels in. And this isn't necessarily a commentary on my employer. Um, this is through conversations across across academia, because um, I'm having those conversations with other schools as well, with the AVMA, with the AAVMC. Um, and I don't, I see, I see the, the economics of the industry putting pressure on employers and they are doing something about it. And I'm seeing the economics of the industry putting pressure on other aspects and they're not doing anything about it. And that concerns me because now you're going to have a disconnect between what employers need and what, cu what customers are expecting um, and what's and what academic academia is producing. And it's difficult for academia not to back up. Cause I think what you have just said is completely accurate and they have their own stressors in place right now with constrained budgets, inflation affecting them, ability to get specialists in to do the academic teaching required against mm -hmm. larger corporates who are able to provide dollars, cents, all the fringe benefits you've just described. They have some major um, 
issues to deal with on their own on their own end as well. Do you feel from the groups that you're a part of that the conversation is at least happening between employers, academics? to what that gap is, or are we in early days from your perspective to the, um, to the reality of the current? If those conversations are happening, I'm not in the room. Okay. So in Canada, yeah. they're happening, but they are behind the scenes right now. Yeah. And that's tough. Yeah. yeah. It, and, it, and it is tough, right? Because when it comes down to messaging and marketing and like, these are things that like, they make some people nervous, but why? Like, what are we nervous about? What, why are we nervous about improving the quality of medicine and the, and the, the quality of the lives impacted by veterinary medicine? That shouldn't be something to shy away from. Um, you should be shouting it from the rooftops. Like, hey, here's what we're doing about it. We see the problems. And are we going to get it all right immediately? No, but we're going to try. And, and the effort is half the part. Agreed. Um, I think there's also a transition in the uh, state of, you know, we've, we've got baby boomers that are retiring. We have a younger generation that has different expectations. I think that's affecting this conversation. That actually yes. buoys me. It, 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 the exact piece that you're nervous about, I'm nervous about, but I think that transition also allows for change in itself too. Younger yeah, generation wants different. Yes. And, and they have different ideas. They have different backgrounds. They have different education. Um, yeah, I mean, they have different finances, right? I, I, my first, I, I'll never forget, um, my first AVMA economic, um, convention, I was sitting at a table, we were doing a little round table, small, little, small groups. And, and this, this older gentleman, he must've been mid seventies, early eighties, something somewhere, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. He learned about what I do and in, in my role. Yep. And he asked, tell me what, why do students need public service loan forgiveness? Why do they need, why do they need income driven repayment plans? Why don't they just pay off their loans? And, and I looked at him, I said, and you know, I'll do respect to someone who's, who's, you know, half a century older than me probably. Um, but you know, what was your, what was your graduating debt load when you, when you left vet school? And he's like, Oh yeah, I, I paid for myself. It cost me about $3,000. And I said, okay, well the average debt load for, for the back in this time, this is 2018. Um, you know, average debt load for a DVM graduating this year or, or last year rather was about $175,000. So you tell me, why do they need public service loan forgiveness? Why do they need increased wages? Why do they need fringe benefits to help them? Because they can't afford other things um, necessarily. Okay. Now with income driven repayment plan, it does open up a lot of opportunities. And, and I think associate veterinarians as well as owners need to be aware of them because, you know, I've had plenty of owners say, well, we offer a, you know, $200 a month student loan stipend. And it's like, great. All you're doing is increasing their taxable income, mm -hmm. which increases their monthly payment on an income driven repayment plan. Do you think $200 a month is going to make a dent in $180,000 of loans? No. no, the math doesn't check out. Right. So when I have that conversation and we walk through what the plans look like and, and, you know, the ins and outs and, why saying, hey, instead of giving them $200 to their loans, maybe you add in an extra 1% match on their 401k. It's like that that helps them in multiple ways, right? Um, not increasing their taxable income and you're helping them save for an eventual retirement. And it's like, oh, well, the light is on, right? And it's all about information's power. Um, and they've been able to take those that information and recruit some really high quality DVM candidates um, who were attracted by you know, not only, not only do they have the benefit, but they understand the plight of the modern associate DVM. And I think that's really what they're looking for is that connection of like, hey, you get it. You get what I'm going through. You understand what's going on in my brain. Even when I'm working on a patient, I might have just had financial stress because I couldn't fill up my gas tank all the way. Because yeah, I'm being paid fairly, but also I'm, I'm paying student loans. I'm paying inflated rent costs. I'm paying, you know, $5 for a gallon of milk, what have you. Um, yeah. And so I think that's ultimately, I don't think they're looking for handouts. I think they're looking for some empathy um, and to walk forward together through these challenges. Do you see that exact example of all those pieces being put in place, being done by at both the independent owner level in the US, as well as the corporate level, one more than the other, is one pushing one more than the other? 
your view? Yes, absolutely. I think um, I think what corporate medicine has um, instigated, for lack of a better word, I think, is is that uh, small private practice, individually owned practices, have seen value in 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 at least becoming some sort of a local conglomerate. Yeah. Um, and that has power because you're able to subsidize costs for 401ks or simple IRAs. Um, you're able to synergize as a, as a nice little fun business buzzword for um, sharing administrative costs, sharing HR costs, those kinds of things, which reduce your bottom line, which allow you to be more profitable and pay your employees better. Um, so I, I am seeing that. I, I think uh, what we are going to see is, so we're in the middle of what my industry calls the great wealth transfer, quote unquote. Um, and we're talking like 10 to $15 trillion of wealth is going to be transferring from, from baby boomers to uh, generally uh, the millennial generation and the Zoomers, Gen Z, over the next handful of years. It's already started. Um, and what that looks like to vet med is all of those practice owners who are boomers and they need to get rid of their practice. They don't want to work forever. Um, and so if you, if you build a, a base of loyalty within your employees, because you're treating them right, you're, you're, you've created a, a great culture um, that people want to stay at. First of all, you don't need non-competes, which is a whole other conversation. Oh, I'd um, love to go down that road in a different time because there's where you yes. and I don't agree, but I'm on the employer side. Love yeah. that conversation. Um, but, but, you know, so first of all, you don't need non-competes because everyone wants to stay there because they're so well-treated. The culture's great. They're getting well rewarded for their hard work, et cetera. Um, but you're also more apt in that instance as the baby boomer, um, uh, vet practice owner to be able to, to, to transition your business to one, uh, one or multiple of those associate DVMs. And they're in a better financial situation to take out that business loan to, to get you out from under the practice, right? Like, Again, it's all like symbiotic. You help me and it helps, you know, you or I help you and it helps me down the road and we're all good in the hood and everybody's happy and healthy and, and thriving. Um, so I, I can't, I can say absolutely corporate can't, coming in and disrupting things has absolutely awakened something. I don't think it is percolated to absolutely every part of the country, but I think it's getting there. And we're going to start finding baby boomers or, or other practice owners. I can't necessarily say only baby boomers that are looking to get rid of their practices. And they're going to have to sell to corporate because they have not done a good job cultivating, um, you know, a place for them to transition over to. And that was going to be my next question specific to the U.S. Um, do you see that corporatization only continuing from your framework and point of view? It sounds like yes, because in certain certain places you see, you know, also that entrepreneurship and, and anti-corporate sentiment coming up in some places as well, which again, spurs innovation, going outside the norm, et cetera. And I'm talking from both sides. So I love your perspective. Yeah. Um, I, there are, there are plenty of DVMs in school right now who want to be practice owners. Um, I don't know what, you know, if there's media out there construing it differently, they want to own a practice. There are plenty that don't also. Yeah. They want the flexibility of putting in PTO and leaving the country for three weeks. They want that flexibility. Um, so again, different strokes for different folks, but there are plenty of people that want to own their own practice. And really when, when it looks, when they're looking at the landscape, it's like, okay, well, I could work for this place for three or four or five years and maybe I buy it from them. But what are the multiples looking like at that point? Is it 3X? Is it 5X? I've seen several deals that are 8, 9, 10X um, revenue. And like, that's on, like what, that's, what, yeah. what, you know, mid-career, early career DVM is going to be able to pony up, a, a, you know, enough cash to afford a $3 million business loan. It's, it's not, it's not practicable. So those people are absolutely going to have to go corporate med if they're going to sell their practice. They have to sell to corporate because that's the only one that's paying that multiple. Yep. Um, but so, so therefore now our, our new associate DVMs that are looking to become practice owners, they're looking at starting from scratch. And that's also inherently disadvantageous because they won't have all the equipment that they need. 
they won't have a clientele base built up, right? Like they're building a business from scratch. And, you know, we know roughly 10 to 15% of new businesses every year succeed where the others fail and they close. Beauty about vet med in the place we're at, if you get to a good start, you can do well. I think there's opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And this is an industry, it's not going anywhere, right? If anything, with the adoption of pet ownership, Amongst millennials and Gen Zs, like vet med will become just that much more important because those generations are prioritizing pet ownership over babies. Yeah. Oh, also yeah. because they can't afford babies, but still. Yeah. Yeah. That's a whole different. Yeah. Another conversation to be had there too. Yeah. Uh, when you look at upcoming year and the thoughts of recession, um, again, we don't give financial advice on this podcast, but is there any viewpoints to upcoming recession and what might be shared with your um, students and or, you know, early grads that are out there. They've not seen a recession happen outside of, you know, 2020, but that was on a whole different scale. Yeah, 2020 was an aberration. Yep. Um, you know, we had we had government intervention that, right. that propped things up earlier. Like the cycle didn't get a chance to play out. First right. and foremost, let me say that recessions are healthy. Um, it's kind of like when a forest, um, and this is a, this is a, a pretty drastic uh, representation, but when a forest needs to burn down, right? Or parts of the forest need to burn to, in order to cultivate, you know, better soil, right? It's a similar kind of thing in the economy. Um, a recession weeds out good companies who, who survive and bad companies die. Um, and that's a good thing because it, it helps the economy continue to progress. Um, so first and foremost, just recognize that recessions are not inherently bad. Um, the second piece is make sure that you're appropriately prepared for the recession because guess what? It could happen at any time. Typical economic cycle is roughly four to eight years long. And by that, I mean, you're going to have a start in a recession, you're going to have recovery, you're going to have peak, and then you're going to have a slowdown, uh, a contraction, and then you're going to go back into a trough or, you know, a recession. So that cycle typically happens every four to eight years. Um, From 2008, it didn't really happen until 2020. So that, that was also an aberration. Um, and you know, the argument could be made that the government kept things going really well for a long time, um, in spite of itself. Um, so first and foremost, they're not bad. Recessions are not bad. Uh, as long as you're prepared, step two, be prepared. And so in some of that, that's education and, and, you know, exposing yourself to economic information and, and updates and CNBC and Bloomberg and, and other, uh, reputable outlets. Um, and then to me, first and foremost, your number one priority should build, be to build an emergency fund. Cash in the bank that's going to cover at least three to six months worth of your expenses sitting there, liquid, um, so that you can dip into no matter what um, happens. If you lose your job, which is not likely in the vet med space, but if you lose your job, you can handle it. You can withstand it. Um, also, putting your emergency fund in an investment is not a good idea because what if you can't get that money out of the investment in case an emergency happens? Um, and then, and you know, there's yeah. there's follow-on goals and investment strategies after that, for sure. Excellent. Well, let's chat on that then. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, and I'm jumping the queue because we still have some questions, but there are people that are going to want to get a hold of you, Andrew, and discuss this further. How do they do so? Yeah, where do they reach out? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the best way is uh, to go to Tide and Tempest. Um, planning.com um, or Andrew Rotz at Tide Tempest. Is it Tide Tempest Financial? Tide Tempest Planning? I don't know. Look at the website. Um, or you can just reach out to me. You can just, you can just Google NC State, um, you know, CVM, personal finance, and you'll find my page at, at NC State. Reach out to me either way. Um, I'm, I'm all for building a network and communicating and trying to help as many people as possible. Even if it's not me that can help, um, I will try to point you in the right direction to get the help that that uh, you you deserve. Excellent. Uh, between yourself and Isaiah Douglas, who we've also had on a couple of times, who's at the Vet Financial Summit, these are, in my view, the individuals you need to be speaking about. And I'm talking to our listeners here right now. If you are in that student framework early or later into your career, uh, I really appreciate your education and uh, really enjoyed our chat at the Vet Financial Summit and all of the information. We don't learn this in vet school unless, again, sounds like NC State has it together. Uh, I wish more colleges had that on offering. So thanks for joining us, Andrew, today. Before we take off, though, we've got some quick action fire questions that we share with all of our guests. 
uh, and I did not prep you for this. So let's go with it. Are let's get after you it. a cat or a dog person? Dog. Look at that. Just like that. Do you guys Easy. have any dogs right now? Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, a year and a half ago, we had my wife's cat and two dogs. We've lost the cat. We've lost the dog. And now we're down to my beloved dog that I've had for, for a decade. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, are you doing what you thought you'd be doing when you were a kid? No, no. I wanted to be a fighter pilot in the Navy. Cool. Um, I got to Navy flight school and I realized, oh, I don't want to do this. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, lot of hot, a lot of hot, sweaty, hot, sweaty cockpits. It's so good. How would your friends describe what you do for a living? Uh, they'd probably say teach finance to vets. Yep. Uh, nice. And then we have to clarify that it's not veterans, it's veterinarians. Yeah. Switch, super, switch groups. Yep. Yeah. Super complicated there. What is your favorite hobby? I consume sports. It's, hey, it's a problem sometimes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I just, you know. I'm not the biggest fan of baseball, but I'll watch lacrosse, hockey, football, soccer, um, ultimate frisbee. Right, like I just enjoy watching competition. Nice. Are you in the, if uh, I get to fantasy play, leagues or just watching it? Um, I've done some fantasy, um, yep. fantasy in the past. Uh, not I'm not the greatest at it, especially with you know two kids and and multiple jobs and a marriage to to maintain. But uh, you know, I still I still dabble a little bit, I guess. It's gotten pretty big up here in Canada over the last few years. <laughs> what in this world are you most grateful for? My family. Um, not just, you know, the family that I've been blessed with uh, that live here in my house, but I just have, we have an incredibly supportive family um, who have, you know, given us advice when things are hard, support when things are great, um, literal help, like when I'm deployed and, and my wife needs help with, with uh, raising the two boys or, you know, just someone to come over and let the dog out when we're crazy busy. Like it's just been super, super, um, uh, rewarding. It's been, it's been a blessing. I'm very thankful for them. Excellent. For anybody watching on YouTube, you can see that come through as well too. It's amazing. Andrew, uh, everything that I wanted out of this conversation with you, thank you very much. I hope the listeners have grabbed a lot of education and know where to reach out to you because this is a lifelong event. It's not a one timer. So thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Very happy to join you. Thank you so much for the time um, in the audience. Um, and feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Like you said, we, we can have six or seven other podcasts if, if you all want, right? So raise a hand, ask the question. We can, we can absolutely get together. We can get Isaiah on here. Um, we, he and I can debate crypto. Like, That's it. We, we've go. done that. Him and I have done that a couple of times too. Actually, I don't even <laughs> know your viewpoint. We'll leave that for after the recording's yeah. done and then we'll get everybody back on. Uh, awesome. So in final, as we do with all of our guests, what message do you want to leave for the veterinary community? Uh, I would say, I would, I would tell the community that is, it is within your power. It is within the realm of possibility to um, be successful, to be, um, to do so in a healthy way um, and promote the success of others and lift the entire community up. But it's going to take education. It's going to take initiative and leaning forward to not just improve things for yourself, but improve things for those around you and the people that are coming after you. I think that's really important for everyone to hear um, that things are looking really good. And I don't think that's going to change. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. 
Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.